इतिहासकार विक्रम संपत आठ किताबों के लेखक फाउंडर आर्काइव ऑफ इंडिया म्यूजिक पूर्व एन एम एम आई के सीनियर फेलो हैं जो गौहर जान और वीडी सावरकर की जीवनी के लिए जाने जाते हैं श्री विक्रम संपत और इस सत्र का संचालन इस दूसरे सत्र के स्पॉन्सर हैं रेखा राव और को स्पॉन्सर हैं श्रीमती श्री लक्ष्मी और श्री वेंकट राव सत्र के संचालन के लिए माइक्रोफोन हम हैंडओवर कर रहे हैं श्री संजय दीक्षित को नमस्ते कल मुझे कई लोगों ने टोका या आपने नमस्कार बोल दिया कहा कि भाई अच्छा ठीक है आई विल करेक्ट इट है जी हाँ कल 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 जुम्मे का अगला दिन था ना इसके पहले Uh, we have a very interesting topic. It is called, but they became us. And this is not my opinion. This is a quotation straight from somebody who actually suffered what is called floxy nosini hilipilification in his own party. Oh, uh, I am sure you all know. I am talking about who. Tell me. Yes. So, ma'am, Shashi Tharoor said that uh, Islamic rule is not at par with the exploitation that we suffered from the British because they became us. So, uh, probably uh, that also leads to this kind of a uh, this kind of, of a proposition also leads to what is Ganga Jamuni Tehzeeb. We know that, and you've done uh, a lot of work on this. So, can you just tell us? Whether you agree or disagree with this proposition, this was made by Shri Shashi Tharoor. According to uh, him, that uh, the Islamic rulers they so completely got assimilated within the Indian culture that uh, they are one with the Indian civilization. Uh, good afternoon, Namaskar. Uh, my study of medieval Indian history tells me that they never became us. and i don't have to quote any other sources except the persian accounts that were written by the court historians of muslim rulers and in the beginning they were very very disturbed at the prospect that they are the rulers of india and they are not able to convert the populace so the first evidence that we have that they never became us is an account written by the court historian of sultan iltutmish and the he is asking the sultan that islam offers only two choices conversion or death so why is it that in india we are not given this option and the sultan says that at the moment we are like salt in a dish our number is so small but when we become more then we will certainly exercise this option the second uh, example that i want to give is of sultan jalaluddin khalji it is written in a court history of his reign that he is telling his courtiers can you imagine what i feel when i see these kafirs singing and dancing under my balcony and going to jamna ji with their idols but i am helpless i cannot do anything so this awareness that the rulers and the religion is very different and opposed to the people and the civilization of the subcontinent is there from the time of the establishment of the muslim state and i don't want to get into the details because i have to other points that i want to cover but this is very well documented and it 
if you think that this problem continued only till the heyday of Muslim power in India, that is not correct. It continued even after that. But I want to discuss an even more fundamental difference. And that was the calculated, deliberate attempt to obliterate and destroy all signs of our culture and civilization and spiritual ethos. There is no ruler of the medieval period, barring one or two exceptions, that did not lead an assault on a sacred site or a sacred center of Hinduism. With the result that in the 18th century, there was no ancient temple left standing in the whole of northern India. The Kashi that we see today is the contribution of the Marathas who rebuilt in the 18th century. So this vast scale decimation of the cultural sites is something that is very well documented. Uh, left historians may try to deny it, but there is no temple which was attacked of which the invaders did not leave enough evidence because they were interested in humiliating you and telling you this is what we have done to you and you cannot do anything and you could not do anything. So uh, everyone knows about the case of Mathura Kashi. I don't want to get into that. But in the 18th century, when Muslim rule was past its prime, we had a lady who rebuilt the Somnath temple, Ahilya Bai Holkar. We are very aware of her. But, 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 what is important is that when Ahilya Bai built the Somnath temple, he did not keep the shivling on the ground floor. In all temples, the main murti is on the ground floor. Ahilya Bhai took the precaution of creating an underground room and the ling was kept there. Because even in the 18th century, she had that fear that any day the temple can be attacked, so I have to protect the ling. So this is the kind of trauma. In the 18th century, when Mughal rule is not there, even then they are building an underground tank to protect the shibli. This kind of uh, situation can I mean, I can go on delib deliberating on this, but I want to make another point about cultural decimation. Uh, you know, in the 18th century, uh, when Mughal rule was in decline, Persian as the court language, which the uh, Mughals imported from Persia, that was able to survive as a court language only as long as the Mughals were in power. In the 18th century, when Mughal power went into decline and they could not sustain Persian, they had to replace Persian with an Indian language, with another language, let me put it like that. And the natural choice in place of Persian was Hindavi. Hindavi was the naturally evolving language of the subcontinent. It incorporated bits and pieces of every language of North India and parts of South India. But for the Muslim, religious and intellectual elite, there was one major problem with Hindi. It was that it was full of Sanskrit, Tatsam and Tadha words. So what do they do? A very conscious and deliberate attempt began in the 18th century to remove Sanskrit words from Hindi and substitute them with Arabic and Persian words. I'll give an example. Aaj prate hai, main yahan jaungi. So prate is related to Sanskrit, so it was replaced with subha. Aaj subha hai main jaungi. Mere paas ye pustak hai. Pustak is thrown out and the word kitab. Ye meri kitab hai. So over a period of about half a century, the process of uh, creating a Muslim language out of a non-Muslim language, it reached such proportions that it was difficult to understand Urdu because it was full of Persian and Arabic words which nobody knew about. So this systematic decimation that took place of our cultural heritage, careful decimation. And these are things that I think we need to talk about and debate about. So I want to draw your attention 
to the attack on the spiritual heritage by way of sacred structures, the attack on the cultural heritage by way of our temples, and the lack and the attack on a linguistic heritage when a Persh, a Muslim language is created out of a non-Muslim one. I'll stop over here. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. वैसे आपने सिर्फ पांच मिनट ही बोला तो ये जो मैंने मैं बात कही ये उर्दू की जिस तरह से जैसे उर्दू क्रिएट हुई है अगर आपको वाकई इसको देखना हो तो हमने जयपुर डायलॉग्स पे जो वेबसाइट है दी जयपुर डायलॉग्स डॉट कॉम उसकी बुक सेक्शन पे फतावा आलमगिरी के वॉल्यूम थ्री का वहाँ पे ट्रांसलेशन डाला हुआ है तो उसमें भी हमने उसका एक तरफ तो उर्दू ट्रांसलेशन का ट्रांसलेशन है वो तो वो उर्दू जो है वो ट्रांसक्राइब्ड है पहले एक साइड में और दूसरे साइड में उसका हिंदी ट्रांसलेशन तो आप उस ट्रांसक्राइब्ड पोर्शन को पढ़ेंगे अगर तो आजकल जो उर्दू बोली जाती है वो ऐसा लगता है कि साहब की हाँ काफी कुछ आप समझ सकते हैं उसको लेकिन उस ट्रांसक्राइब्ड पोर्शन को अगर आप पढ़ेंगे तो आई गारंटी यू तो बड़े बड़े उर्दू दा भी हैं हमारे तुफैल जी भी कई शब्द नहीं समझ पाए उसमें तो वो इस तरह से जो मैम कह रही हैं कि बिल्कुल कंप्लीटली पर्सनाइज एडवाइज लैंग्वेज विद इंडियन ग्रामर प्राकृत तो आई कम टू संदीप संदीप जी दिस ट्रोप दैट इज ब्रॉट आउट सेइंग दैट टू डे दैट दे बिकेम आस you think this is a deliberate attempt to weaken our civilizational resistance we just had a session on civilizational resistance and i think uh, you are in a best position because you've done so much work on this so could you enlighten us why exactly do they try to do this yeah thank you uh, good afternoon first of all it's great to be back here on jaipur dialogues and fantastic uh, organization so before i actually get into answering your uh, question i would uh, you know like to add a small correction to what shri vishnu jain thanks to him and uh, both both vishnu ji and anand ranganathan said that you know hindus are second class citizens or ninth class citizens the latest amendment ninth amendment to the thing <clears throat> small correction hindus are not citizens of any class by any definition of the word hindus are targets basically so that is uh, uh, the thing and uh, now to get to the whole point but they became us right so basically like sanjeev ji pointed out it is uh, a variant of the ganga jamuni tehzeeb and uh, put another way also can be understood as uh, a phenomenon where the islamic topi has a veto over the hindu choti and uh, you should not people in rajasthan should not feel sad that they don't have the sacred ganga or jamuna here they have a variant of ganga jamuna tehzeeb here some 3 4 hours journey from here it is called uh, ajmer darga so uh, this is pretty much uh, uh, how it goes and uh, we will have to mention here that every hindu who visits a darga or a mazar is actually making himself or herself a halal for the coming battle and uh, with that i would like to you know also add a quote by uh, uh, the late vs naipaul who said a very memorable line that every muslim who is not an arab is a convert i repeat that again every muslim who is not an arab is a convert so this is what you are faced with and you know this is uh, the psychology of what islamic invasions uh, uh, you know actually do to people uh, who are, who they conquer and cut, convert if not if they not uh, killed and uh, as far as islamic rule in india is concerned at no point uh, in the long history of uh, uh, you know muslim history of india did any muslim empire rule over all of india so all this nonsense about and they became us and this ganga jamuni tehzeeb is complete bogus utter bogus and at no point in the same period 
did Hindus ever willingly accept Muslim rule? At no point. This is a documented fact of Indian history. You take, you know, any source, literary source, uh, oral legends, accounts, temple histories, everything. Hindus at any point did not willingly submit or accept uh, uh, Muslim rule. And uh, the correct terminology that should be applied, at least in the scope of my limited studies, to the so-called medieval Muslim period, as it is an incorrectly known, should be actually called the age of resistance. That is what it is. It is not the medieval Muslim period, it is the age of resistance, really. And uh, you have a long list of this greatness of Mughals. Um, I think Omindraji correctly said yesterday, he spoke about Akbar the debauch, uh, not Akbar the great. And uh, for the record, the kind of slaughter, the genocide that he did in Chittorgarh, uh, at every point in that battle, he's written, uh, I mean, his chronicles, uh, chroniclers uh, wrote a very laudatory account of that uh, uh, siege and uh, of Mewad. At every point, every decisive turn in the battle, Akbar would turn to the Quran for inspiration. He would, you know, quote the specific ayats to give him strength. So this is, uh, he, his own chroniclers have documented it. And then Shah Jahan, I mean Jahangi, the less said about him, the better. He was unfortunately the son of a Hindu woman, Akbar's wife. See at what all levels this thing uh, operates. And uh, it was during Shah Jahangir's misrule and even, even worse during Shah Jahan's time that an entire castration industry uh, took birth. His uh, impoverishment of Hindus, his extortionate taxes was so high that especially in the Bengal and, you know, partly uh, in the Bihar region, Hindu peasants and, you know, uh, laborers, they would castrate their own sons and sell them as slaves just to pay the tax. And you grow, and that in turn births the huge uh, uh, industry of middlemen and pimps who would buy these uh, young boys and send them where? To Jananas. So this is the great Mughal prosperity you're talking about, really. And uh, so that is the entire picture you get. Slave trade, economic destruction, castration industry. And then uh, uh, somebody was mentioning yesterday, I think uh, you, Abhijit, about uh, uh, Binmal or Billamala. So it is Binmal a few hours drive from here, from Jaipur. So there used to be a beautiful temple called Billamala Deva, which, which is a derivative of Aditya or Surya temple. And uh, it was also the home of uh, many scholars and uh, astronomer, Bhaskaracharya, if I'm not mistaken. The first brush of Binmal with Islam completely ravaged it and caused a mass exodus of extremely prosperous uh, uh, Jain and Hindu businessmen who migrated neighboring state to Gujarat to Sanjan, which is unfortunately today known only as a place where Parsis first landed in India. It was also the place of a great Surya temple, which is known as Billamala Deva, which was built by Hindu uh, uh, merchants who were forced uh, to migrate from uh, Binman. So these are, you know, connections nobody tells you. And you somehow want us to, you know, broad brush all this and call it Ganga Jamani Tezi that, you know, Hindu Muslim bye bye really. And uh, if we accept the fiction that masquerades as history, that, you know, it was the Mughals or Akbar at any rate who united India, we should also equally accept, by the same logic, we should also equally accept that the same Mughals did a rotten job of protecting and preserving India's unity and integrity. You can't have it both ways. It was during Jahangir's period that, you know, uh, the fabled naval power of Hindu empires throughout our history, this was a maritime culture in both commerce and uh, military perspectives. So <clears throat> it was completely destroyed and it was Jahangir and his corrupt officials, Asaf Jha and his uh, equally corrupt wife, Noor Jahan, all these uh, people, they started selling farmers to all European traders and they began to lose territory while this guy was having his fun in his zanana, hunting expeditions, you know, things like that. So we come back to this same point again. 
I mean, what are we talking about this whole uh, Hindu-Muslim unity, Bhai Bhai, Bhai Chara, Ganga Jamuni Tehzeeb, and uh, just on the point of uh, the cultural destruction that uh, Meenakshi ji uh, said, we have a tradition of piety, you know, Sadhu, San, Sanyasi in uh, Hinduism, which we, this, this whole Tehzeeb, they became us and all this, this kind of formulation, it equates our sadhus and sons and rishis with whom? Sufis. So I've just pulled up something that I've published on Dharma Dispatch and just give you this, uh, uh, read it out quickly in a couple of minutes. So Nizamuddin Aulia, uh, unfortunately the <coughs> New Delhi still has a railway station named after this bigot. Ten minutes. Yeah. So Nizamuddin Aulia used to run a very fantastic prosperous uh, khanka and it was nothing but a den of depravity and it was a magnet for the Muslim aristocracy in that period. And one of the central attractions of his khanka was something called a Sama sessions. So just to put it politely, what a Sama session meant was what is today known as a Sufi music, you know, shouting and screaming. So that used to be sung and uh, liquor, wine and opium and hashish used to flow. But apart from that, all the Sufi sheikhs and calendars and other Muslim devouts and the aristocrats, Aulia used to organize a practice known as Nazar Ilal Murd. I hope I got the pronunciation right. What it means is that gazing with intense concentration on good looking boys. So how old were these boys? Their ages ranged anywhere from 12 to 16, but the mandatory uh, point requirement for these boys, they were slaves basically, mandatory requirement was that they had to be beardless boys, meaning prepubescent boys. And all these divines, these Muslim saints, Sufis, they would gaze at them intensely and after a while, they would lapse into great fits of ecstasy. So you want, to, I don't think I need to expand on this point. No, that. So, so you want to equate this with our scenes like Santukaram, Tyagaraja, really? Okay, okay we Kandaraja got the point, Tehzeeb. Sandeep ji. We, we've got the point, absolutely. Uh, we move on and that's actually a wonderful way of uh, doing Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb. It's a wonderful way of doing Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb. So I want to tell you that, uh, just to mention, uh, Professor Mahavir Prasad Jain is sitting here. They have a lot of research on the Maktubat of uh, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Sarhindi. And Sheikh Ahmed Sarhindi is the one who is the most important part of Islam. And they have written this clearly that you don't want to pass any Hindu to any Hindu. Why don't you pass any Hindu? Why don't you treat him as a dog? Why? Because if he has known your thoughts and has no doubt of any kind of thought, if he has gone to Islam, he will be destroyed. So, oh, I urge Rahul Roshan and Sankran Ji, if they are there, uh, Professor Jain has a priceless collection of these letters and translations. Please contact him and get him to write for your journals. Uh, wonderful knowledge he, he can uh, impart you. Now I'm coming to Abhas Ji. Abhas Ji is doing a big job. Because we are talking about the Islamic culture. That they became us. They came to our house. But they didn't go back to our house. They did so much of our love. That they had to stay in our उस घर पे कब्जा करके हमको आउट हाउस में रहने की जगह दे दी इसलिए दे बिकेम अस और आभास आभास जी जो हैं वो एक छह वॉल्यूम की किताब लिख रहे हैं केवल मुगलों के ऊपर क्योंकि इस दे बिकेम अस वाली जो ये जो दे बिकेम अस वाली जो स्कीम है इसमें जो मुगल जो हैं वो बहुत आगे माने जाते हैं क्योंकि संभवत Ganga and Yamuna who have not been born in Bhagirath Rishi Ji. Abhaz Ji, you have written a book on Babar. So, what way did Babar have been born in Ganga Jamuni Tehzeeb? You have 10 minutes. Yeah. 
thank you namaskar to everyone well as far as this thesis is concerned whether they became one of us hindi mein bol sakte hain to boliye kripa theek hai jahan tak is baat ka is baat ka sawal hai ki agar wo hamare jaise hue ya nahi so i will just like to take you back to your school days to set the present and then take you ahead with the examples when you walk into a new city a place where the language is different language alag hai school काफी अलग है वहां पे आप दोस्त बनाने की कोशिश करते हो लेकिन यू फाइंड इट वेरी टफ यू बिकम वेरी एलियनेटेड एंड देन व्हेन यू सी दैट जो ट्रेडिशंस रिलीजियस फेस्टिवल्स वगैरह जो सेलिब्रेट हो रहे हैं वो अभी काफी अलग हैं आपके रिलीजियस इंसिग्निया को आपसे छीन लिया जाता है देन यू फर्दर गेट मोर एंड मोर अलूफ सो एज फार एज बिकमिंग वन ऑफ अस इज कंसर्न इट कैन नॉट हैपन अनलेस द लैंग्वेज इज वेरी मच रिलेटेड टू यू Until unless your traditional religious insignia are very much kept alive with you. Coming back to uh, the the Mughal emperor, Mughal emperors. Now, how many of us know that Akbar actually gave the title title of Akbar to himself? It was actually bestowed to himself when he was being crowned. So. so when we say this uh, word akbar the great that itself is a becomes very hilarious because it's you are saying greater the great the great so there are many more anecdotes from the life of this mughal emperors which not only shows us that they were bit more narcissists they were very opportunist now as far as the being opportunist is concerned it goes back to their forefather who is taimur now i am uh, looking to deliberate a bit upon taimur because if you want to learn that why this mughal empire was operating the way it was like intermarrying and all those ways like which are the cases which are used to say that they became one of us it's actually is coming from taimur himself so taimur is coming uh, is the 10th generation from the tumane khan and changiz khan is coming in the 5th generation now Taimur was a very opportunistic person he wanted to not only become the great khan but also he had this desire of becoming the caliph both the attributes were with him now unfortunately he neither could become the khan because he was not coming from the descent of changiz khan nor he could become the caliph because he didn't had the lineage which is required to become a caliph then he started to scheme upon the first thing what he did is that he married into the lineage of the mongol clan that is the changiz khan's lineage and then he became the amir of balkh and that is how he starts gaining the power and that's where the term gurkhania comes in gurkhania is the term for son in law so the term mughal which we are using for the so called empire is absolutely inappropriate because uh, uh, they themselves never called themselves as mughals they always saw themselves as timurid from the lineage of timur itself and fair enough because uh, when we see that uh, uh, why the term mughal came into being there is a writing by uh, 18th century scholar called gibbon where he is saying that uh, dr lock can be compared with changiz khan dr lock or if many people don't know about him he is the guru of the voltaire who is considered to be the epitome of freedom of speech and what not so so dr lock was uh, dr lock and the compa comparison was made between dr lock and the changiz khan changiz khan was seen as a epitome of secularism because he was not persecuting the people in the name of religion in the contrast taimur was always about persecution in the name of religion his persecution was not having the uh, it, it was nowhere in the parallel line with how changiz khan used to do it so somehow with uh, around 18th century or something the mongols became very much identical to go to the imperialistic power which they wanted to pursue they wanted to show that they are liberal they are secular so that that's where the mughal name itself penetrate into the segment now coming to this that whether they became one of us or not it's it's i completely disagree to it they definitely didn't become one of us now if we start with babar itself his whole desire to come to bharat or hindustan as he writes in babar nama was to fulfill the 
the desire, uh, unfinished agenda of Taimur. When we see that what was the agenda of Taimur, then we have to go back to his biography written by Yazdi himself, where Yazdi says that the purpose of the lifetime purpose of Taimur is to Islamize the whole of the world, including the Hind. So if he is coming here to uh, fulfill the uh, unfinished agenda of Taimur, then it has to be the Islamization as the first thing. And then we, when we further move, further move into the life of Babur, there we see the cases where he has invoked jihad whenever it was required. Uh, when he was going to have a battle with Rana Sangha, jihad is invoked. He says that it's a jihad and it's a holy war. Now, there is a narrative which is built around that they were actually trying to make us richer. How true it is. Because uh, just the ancestor of Babur, if we just go back, uh, son of Sharu, uh, son of Taimur, Shahrukh, had sent his ambassador Abdul Rajak to Vijayanagar Empire. And Abdul Rajak was so surprised. He saw that uh, the amount of gold which is flowing into Vijayanagar, it's amazing. He was not able to make comparison with the spaces what he lived in or the bazaars were there. They were not at all comparable with the forts what he saw in the Vijayanagar. So there was no comparison in terms of scale and proportion. It was just way beyond his imagination. So Herat, which was considered to be a very rich place of the Temurs, was not anywhere comparable to the, the great Vijayanagar empire. Now, we are told that the person, Babur, who was more of a loser king, he was not able to win any fronts back in his home. He was uh, more like a loser king as Farishta quotes him. He was a chessboard king. Because uh, we people who play chess would know that a king just do nothing but hops on from this place to another. So he was a chessboard king. He just couldn't reinforce a single position for himself. So now this loser will come to India to make us wealthier. Of course not. Because in fact, uh, uh, when he writes his, uh, uh, his, his turning in Kabul in his maternal uncle's place, he was so happy to live in the palace that because his whole life he was camping here and there living in the tents. So there was no sense of living in the fort. So he has written all this account that how happy he felt. When, then when he first uh, had this first uh, uh, victory in India and the loots were made, then we have an account in Babar Nama that how he is actually disposing all the wealth to his people. He is sending the wealth to Samarkand and so on and on. So he had no interest in doing something good for people. All his intention to come to Bharat was to uh, really get a, some land for himself to rule and uh, fulfill the desire of Taimur, which remained unfinished. And we see that uh, from 1580 to 1820, our GDP per capita growth is in negative. So GDP per capita is a very essential factor, which tells you that how much wealthy the people are. So yes, 24.5% was the GDP share when the Bab when Babur came into India. Around Akbar's period, it was for the first time that our GDP share of the world reduced below China. It happens in 1620 AD. But at the same time, while GDP share is almost constant, 25, 26, and something like that, GDP per capita is reducing. So it, gave, it uh, tells you that while the wealth was being unmasked in the Mughal empire, the wealth of the, with the people, the capital was reducing. It gives you no sign that the people were prosperous. And uh, do I have time, Sanjay? One minute. Okay. So I must, uh, uh, because the, the thing is so vast. This, and, uh, more, yeah. this is much more than 30 seconds. Okay. So now I must tell you the story of the Taj Mahal. It's quite important because... Um, Taj Mahal is very much related to Deccan, the great Deccan famine of 1630s because uh, when, uh, the, the, when Taj Mahal was built, there was a great famine in the uh, belt of Deccan and up towards the Gujarat. Now, you, I don't know how many people are aware that this famine was very much created by Shah Jah himself and it comes from the account of Lahori, who, who, has, who has been the chronicler for Shah Jah. It talks about how the cultivation was really ravished and it was put down. And uh, at the same time, of course, there were monsoons were lesser, but his devastation of the crops and at the same time, how the rain got didn't really show up in the time. It coupled to make the famine very much visible. 
and it is in this period when Shah Jahan decided to build the Taj Mahal and around 41.8 million silver rupees were invested to build the Taj Mahal as the records say and that time during the famine one rupees could give you around 280 kgs of rice that's the record says so and around eight um, eight seven or eight million people succumb to this famine so if we see churchill to be responsible for the great famine of bengal why shouldn't we call shah jahan as the person as responsible for the this famine and he should be as murderous as we see a churchill as so taj mahal no way is a sign of love or empathy for me but it's more like, and of course, the story behind also tells you that it, of course, was not a tale of love or anything as such, but it was more about the uh, the, the, the the imperialistic fortunes what Shah Jahan wanted to make, and it also shows the it is a symbol of the repression uh, of the people of India what they faced in the Great Famine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Omenji. Uh, I Vikram Ji. Ke paas विक्रम जी ये जो मैं प्रश्न पूछने वाला हूं उससे पहले मैं आपको एक उदाहरण देता हूं और वो आपके साथ जो हुआ है उससे भी काफी कुछ संबंधित है और वो ऐसा है कि हम काफी कुछ जैसे जैसे गंगा जमनी तहजीब के बारे में सुनते हैं वैसे ही कश्मीर में कश्मीरियत के बारे में सुनते हैं ऋषि इस्लाम के बारे में सुनते हैं और मुझे काफी दिनों बाद ये पता चला और मुझे मेरे कश्मीरी मित्रों ने डॉक्टर अजय त्रुंगु इत्यादि ने बताया कि ये दोनों के दोनों जो टर्म हैं ये किसी भी मुस्लिम साहित्यकार ने या क्रॉनिकलर ने नहीं बनाए जो कश्मीरियत जो शब्द गढ़ा गया वो एक कश्मीरी हिंदू द्वारा गढ़ा गया और जिस ऋषि इस्लाम की चर्चा बार-बार होती है और जिसे नंद ऋषि कहा जाता है उसे किसी भी इस्लामिक रिकॉर्ड में नंद ऋषि नहीं कहा गया हमेशा शेख नूरुद्दीन कहा गया और कहीं भी किसी भी ऋषि इस्लाम की बात नहीं है हमेशा उन्हें शेख उल इस्लाम कहा गया तो ये जो समस्या है ये क्या हिंदुओं द्वारा क्रिएट की गई है जी थैंक यू संजय जी वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन आई थिंक आई हैव अ वेरी एक्यूट डिसएडवांटेज दीस आर द डेज ऑफ टी20 सो लिमिटेड ओवर मैच में लास्ट बैट्समैन when most of the other st- stalwart batsmen have already made the runs there's very little time left and all yeah, the points that need to be covered aapko to slower ball di ja rahi hai i hope duck out na ho jaau but uh, so uh, and also the the other thing is you know i specialize and my interest is largely in uh, modern and early modern and modern indian history but then medieval history uh, and what we are discussing today to a large extent inspires uh, or leads into that period that i uh, you know uh, research about just to give a context i mean to summarize i think all the great points that uh, the other speakers made uh, american historian will durant uh, you know he called the islamic conquest of india as one of the bloodiest stories of human history not just of indian history but human history uh but then do we ever pause and think that in our popular narrative in our textbooks in our discourse to uh is this subject given that kind of commensurate importance to see and just a few bullet points of you know facts and figures because i think that gives an idea of the scale of damage um as you all know historian sitaram goyal ji in his seminal work had documented something like at the minimum about 40000 uh, you know temples that were destroyed uh, just in those 500 years between 1000 ce with the conquest of afghanistan till the end of the delhi sultanate in 1525 uh close to the the population of the indian subcontinent Vikram itself Vikram just just interjection sorry his list is uh, uh, 2000 temples the list that is given sitaram sitaram goel these the list that is compiled is 2000 temples 2000 but 40000 is what is yes but he says that of course his work was incomplete right, he had just right. begun the work the the consensus around the number of temples is that but uh, you know the the population of the subcontinent itself the indian subcontinent fell by 80 million between this same period so obviously people didn't just fall down drop down dead so there were lots of conquests there were uh, there was bloodshed something close to 25 lakh women were taken away as slave traders sex traders 
to the far away lands of the middle east to afghanistan to ghazni so much so that as you all know uh, there is that minar in ghazni too with that infamous uh, you know line there saying dukhtare hindustan nilame do dinar uh, the daughters of hindustan are auctioned here for 2 dinars each uh, so this scale and the kind of desecration of our knowledge systems our libraries uh, whether it was takshashila nalanda vikramshila uh, when nalanda was attacked by uh, that barbarian bakhtiar khilji it is said that the manuscripts the books that were there they burned for close to 6 to 8 months uh, they, there was that amount of knowledge that had to be destroyed and it's a great irony today that if you come out of the nalanda university the uh, nalanda area the railway station is bakhtiarpur so as i think my good friend anand ranganathan mentioned we are the only country where we probably eulogize these uh, barbarians of the past we are the only ones where uh, removing these vestiges of desecration is thought of in some way as being detrimental to today's social cohesion unity be between communities and all of that whereas time and time again i've maintained that this whole edifice of national unity social cohesion between communities it cannot rest on the shaky foundations of fabricated and whitewashed history which is what we are fed through all along now there have been different you know waves to of this uh, of the interaction of islam uh, islamic conquest uh, in india it started of course with the arabs uh, and even there with, with the, the the resistance that we put it was from the 7th century 636 or so when the first arab invasion started but it took them about 70 years to actually capture uh, you know parts of sindh uh, by mohammed bin qasim now at the same time just see what was happening in other parts of the world within a less than a century of the passing away of uh, prophet muhammad driven by a religious zeal the uh, the forces of the caliph went all over the world to crush the infidels now in no time the byzantine empire the sassanid empire large parts of central africa uh, central asia northern africa Uh, were all islamized syria palestine egypt all those regions iran they were all uh, persia were all uh, you know uh, islamized and the islamic uh, empire stretched from the atlantic in the west to the gates of india on the east but it took them 500 years to actually establish a proper islamic kingdom in india in 1206 with the delhi sultanate so when we talk of resistance which was also an important uh, element of the previous session the civilizational resistance that we put also in terms of valor in terms of courage in terms of pushback which is not told to us that we always covered in front of invaders i think that is totally wrong uh, those uh, nations which within a couple of decades fell to the might of the sword here we managed to push back for 500 years and then of course we had these waves and waves of uh, conquest whether it was mahmud of ghazni or gori the turks and there too as meenakshi ji rightly pointed out we need to go only to the primary sources themselves where the uh, you know the, uh, the the chroniclers the persian chroniclers and the court historians they actually revel in the fact or uh, extol their sultan for being iconoclastic uh, on the contrary we have today's historians who whitewash those crimes and the famous example is of mahmud ghazni when he goes to somnath mandir uh, you know the priests there we are told including by the likes of professor romila thapar that uh, you know it was only economic considerations that brought mahmud ghazni there and it was not theological reasons or for reasons of religion now but what do the court historians say what does farishta say what does al baruni say uh, what does minhaj siraj who wrote about all this say that mahmud goes to somnath the chalukyan ruler has run away uh, bhim deva and when he goes to somnath he is astonished to see there are 50000 common hindus who are actually uh, you know armed and trying to put a resistance these are not uh, you know members of the uh, royal family or something these are 50000 uh, you know common hindus who are trying to protect their deity it takes him one week to actually annihilate all of them and then he marches victoriously into the sanctum sanctorum and there the priests come running to him and say look if you want money we will give you all the money you want you take this and go please let's protect our deity 
and to this he laughs and says that if i do that i will be called a trader of idols i would rather be called as or my legacy i would rather be remembered as a butchikan or a uh, you know breaker of idols and that's when he demolishes the he demolishes the temple the lingam is pounded and taken away back to ghazni so in the wake of primary evidence like this despite that we have our historians today talking about that now slowly as the sultanate period also you know advanced uh, and towards the end once conquest became uh, you know untenable and also a lot of uh, 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 you know invasions murders all of that once they had run their course if you know that the four schools uh, hanafi shafi uh, maliki and hanbali schools of uh, islam the hanafi school allowed that you know it was not a, a binary between death and conversion you could uh, allow the infidels to live but they had to live under extremely humiliating conditions so almost something like 18 to 20 humiliating conditions had to be put in front of the kafirs uh, whenever there is uh, anybody of the faithful going then you need to stand up if they even spit into your face you need to take that in uh, and you of course uh, slave trade all of that continued even the fatwa alamgiri talks about sex trade at the peak of uh, aurangzeb's rule even during the peak of uh, you know the mughal empire jizya was about 20% of the revenue of uh, the kingdom so uh, discriminatory practices against those who did not belong to the faith when that is a theme that is a part of the empire how did they become us and this, uh, you know, this whole thing of the Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb, where was the give and take? It was only a large part of one group, which was appropriated, completely changed beyond belief uh, and recognition and made into something else. Uh, Meenakshi Ji spoke about the language, uh, you know, and how that changed. I would also like to add, uh, you know, art forms, whether it was, you know, uh, classical music and uh, classical dance, particularly in North India. Um, uh, the Dhru uh, Dhrupad or the Dhruvapada, which was the uh, the main classical, the oldest classical art form, particularly from northern India, which is very, very spiritual. You've had some of the greatest saints and savans, the mystics who, uh, you know, uh, uh, practice that, uh, Swami Haridas and so many others. From the confines of Dhrupad, it had to, it had to be exorcised. All the uh, references to gods, to... Uh, to Shiva, to uh, Vishnu, which is very much even now in the Dhrupad Bandishes, you have uh, the Dhruvapadas, you still have, uh, you know, it's it's almost like religious music, very similar to what you find in the South with Carnatic music. But Dhrupad also, the, the God element had to be removed from it and it had to become a Shringar Pradhan uh, kind of a thing where God is not there. The Shahenshah becomes the person who is eulogized Pia, Balma, and all these kind of lyrics that we find, the khayal also, you know, uh, transforms into something which is totally different. So a Tansen uh, converted from a Hindu Brahmin family, brought in, and then uh, this, uh, you know, transformation happens. Similarly, the, uh, the Kathakars, the Kathakars across our temples who sang and danced and who gave the origins to our Kathak uh, dance form, that also was completely transformed the... the the faith aspect completely stripped of it, Ten and the courtesans, uh, the courtesan uh, culture, which uh, again changed it again, the Shringar Pradhanness of this art form, uh, is what took uh, root in our Mughal courts. Of course, these are ex great art forms which we're very proud of. But then to say that you know uh, they became us, I think that is a huge stretch of imagination in the course of this long march of Indian history, particularly of invasions. I think it's a wounded civilization which has lost, which has been stripped of a lot of its, uh, you know, uh, elements identity. And today it is time that we reclaim it. In conclaves like this, you know, uh, it's very common that we all sit in the room and put those, uh, you know, the, the darts on that uh, voodoo doll of the leftist historians and we keep saying oh they did this Romila Thapar did this, Irfan Habib did this but I think as Professor Kapil Kumar said in the previous uh, you know, intervention when he uh, got up it is time that we stop blaming these people it is time we start doing something about correcting that, it is time that you know history gets rewritten 
there is no great surprise in uh, recounting the details of what those uh, people did. That is their job. They will do that. That is their dharma. They are being very true to their dharma. So let us be true to our dharma and try to actually make this a national movement. I know individuals here, including those on this stage, we are doing our small little bits to course correct history, to rewrite this, and to make all these, uh, you know, uh, the, the Hindu genocide, uh, if we can say that, over these thousand years, uh, you know, public knowledge. But Jnanam Paramam Balam, unless it comes out in the form of a proper book, which will last for a thousand years, uh, it's it's very difficult to ensure that this knowledge reaches out, particularly to the next generation. So this should become a, nas a kind of a project, a national movement among all of us. And uh, hats off to people like Sanjay Dikshit ji who are doing such great work for bringing out the Fatwai Alamgiri. Once it is translated uh, into English and Hindi and all other languages, I think uh, other than fighting court cases with me, Audrey Trushki will have another kind of problem as well. Meenakshi ji, uh, up, uh, yes. points uh, you want to make. I want you to draw attention to one aspect of this problem that we have uh, missed so far, and that is the question of the marriage alliances of the Muslim rulers. You see, uh, it's all documented that from Akbar onwards, they married Rajput princesses. And it is surprising that though they married routinely into Rajput royal families, they never regarded themselves as the children or the offsprings of Rajput mothers and Mughal fathers. All the Persian histories that were written in the medieval period, they said the Mughals are pure Timurids. So they just ignored the fact that they had Hindu mothers. No history that was written as a court history mentioned these marriages. And what is even more surprising is that the Rajput rulers who gave their daughters and sisters in marriage to the Mughal emperors never mentioned it themselves. And I want to cite one or two examples. You know, these Rajput rulers who entered into an alliance with the Mughals, they were very, very conscious of the fact that history may not judge them properly. History may be unkind to them. History may say, why did you surrender? Why did you not continue fighting? So all the major Rajput royal families, they asked their historians in their own jagir to write counter histories. I mean, this is absolutely amazing. Now, for example, I'll give the example because all of us have heard of Raja Mansi. So Raja Mansi was Akbar's closest friend and he was a leading Mansabdar. But in his court, Mansi asked a person to write the history of his family, which has survived. It is called Man Charit. Man Charit, the history of Mansi's family. In that history, Man Charit, the historian does not mention that Mansin's grandfather gave his daughter in marriage to Akbar. It is not mentioned in any Rajput court history written in the medieval period. And this was such a troublesome relationship and such a terrible trauma for the Rajputs that many centuries later, when Emperor Farooq Siyar died, he was the Mughal emperor after Aurangzeb, some few decades after Aurangzeb. When Farooq Siyar died, the Mughal empire was not so powerful. So what did this Anna of Mewar? His daughter was married to Farooq Siyar. It's very difficult to believe, but the Rana went to the Mughal Darbar and brought his daughter out and said, and no, it's historically... Uh, it's not a, fa a figment of imagination, it is there. And in fact, the three Rajput states of Mewar, Marwar, and Jaipur, they signed a treaty with each other. They said, we promise each other that in future, we will never give our daughters to the Mughals. So when, and this, these are records. So when we talk about Ganga Jamni Tehzi, we have to keep this in mind. 
And just one more point that I want to make. Uh, Vikram talked about Mahmood Ghaznavi's attack on Somnath. And it's a very interesting retaliation, which is recorded in a Persian history of that time. When uh, Ghaznavi is going back, he wants the people to give him a short route to go back home. So uh, two Hindu guides, they say, we will take you back to a short route to Ghazni, I mean, to your home. They take uh, Mahmud Ghaznavi's army. And after one day, the army says, we want water. So please lead us to the stretch of water because we, the guide says, what you did to my deity, I could not protect my deity, but I can act and take revenge on behalf of my deity. I've deliberately brought you to a passage where there is no water and you'll all die of thirst. Yes, Sadibi, you wanted to make a point? Yeah, just a couple of points about, you know, on the broader themes related to Ganga Jamani Tezi, but uh, more fundamentally, what uh, the successive waves of Islamic invasions and, you know, the establishment of uh, Muslim rule uh, did to the Indian psyche, the Hindu psyche, broadly speaking. So for the first time in India, the undivided Hindu society, right? I won't get into all this Varna business and all that. Uh, for all practical purposes, the Hindu society was Hindu. For all practical purposes. So that's, that's not for others to comment on. So for the first time, you had a society within a society. So you had the original Hindus and then this newly created enclaves of converted uh, Hindus, possibly into Islam. And from then onwards, these two communities, you know, society within society, never merged. So in 1946, when this so-called direct action day was happening, uh, Pandit Madan Mohan Malya explicitly mentions that in a very painful speech, he says that he galvanizes the Hindu society. That, you know, partition will be inevitable and that at no point in my life did I ever think that one section of the same, of people of the same society are constantly at war with the other section. And we have no option but to galvanize. But yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is long-term psyche. And this uh, creation of this new section of Indian Muslims, uh, they began to grow substantially in number during Balban's time. And uh, Balban's rule, until Balban's rule, it was basically the Turkic Muslims who were at the helm of uh, affairs in the Delhi Sultanate. And when the numbers of Indian Muslims uh, uh, grew, a guy called, a courtier called Imaduddin Rihan or Raihan. So he began to have aspirations to become a Sultan. And his logic was straightforward. He said, look, you say Islam means universal brotherhood of all Muslims. So if I am also Muslim by your standards, right? So why can't I become a Sultan? And then those guys get together, they form a cabal headed by Balban before he becomes a Sultan. And then they, you know, boat him out and finally he's executed. So this is the other thing. And this is that Indian Muslims. All these guys, uh, there are fantastic tales. You should read these uh, myths created about Jinnah in Pakistan, especially. There are fantastic tales attributing his ancestry directly to Muhammad. You see uh, what okay. this does, yeah. You see what this, this kind of thing does, this Ganga Jamani Tezi. And on that point, and uh, this is my uh, uh, closing uh, uh, submission, it is one thing that our <clears throat> so called uh, leftist uh, historians, uh, it's one thing that they've distorted our history. Uh, both Hindu history and Islamic history. It is one thing for them to do that. But how does Pakistan teach its, its own past to its own children? Two, why isn't the hist Hindu history of Pakistan not taught in India? Several of our sacred spaces, Tirtha Kshetras, they are all lying in Pakistan. They are gone now, pretty much. Multan example, Mulasthana. So it was among the 12 fabled shrines of Aditya, Surya Mandirs, the dotted undivided Bharata Varsha. It had a sanctity Sandeepji. equivalent, if not greater than... Yeah, 30 uh, seconds. 30 seconds, okay. 
So sanctity uh, equal to, if not greater than Kashi, Mathura, Prayag and Rameshwaram. Today, it is the world's largest, single largest concentration of Sufi shrines. So this is what you're looking at. I'll stop. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for stopping in 20 seconds instead of 30. That's rare. <laughs> Now we have some uh, uh, one or two minutes for some questions. Ye sawal hai Meenakshi Jain ji se. Ye prashn hai Deepak Singh ji ka. Ye Devbhumi Uttarakhand se hai. Hamare Shri Krishna ji aur Bhagwan Shri Ram ji ki patima itihas mein Mathura aur Ayodhya se kalantar mein kahan chali gayi? Dekhiye murtiyan kahan chali gayi? Iska jawab dena to mushkil hai. लेकिन मथुरा में जो सबूत हमको मिला है कि वहाँ पे एक मंदिर था तो वो एक इंस्क्रिप्शन मिला है वो 2000 साल पुराना है तो ये कोई कहे कि ये मस्जिद की डिमांड एक रीसेंट डिमांड है और कुछ पॉलिटिकल पार्टीज ने प्रमोट किए ये बिल्कुल गलत है क्योंकि मेरी एक पुस्तक है मैं उसका प्रचार नहीं करना चाह रही लेकिन जो सबूत किसी कोर्ट को भी स्वीकार करना पड़ेगा क्या सबूत कोर्ट स्वीकार करेगी इंस्क्रिप्शंस इंस्क्रिप्शंस एक सबूत हैं और मैंने 10 15 इंस्क्रिप्शंस कोर्ट किए हैं वो सारे इंस्क्रिप्शंस लगभग 100 साल पहले डिस्कवर किए थे मथुरा के इलाके से और सबसे पहला इंस्क्रिप्शन कटरा केशव देव से है और जो सारे इंस्क्रिप्शन हैं वो सब खंडित हैं क्योंकि मथुरा पे इतनी बार आक्रमण हुए और कितने तो खो गए लेकिन मैं आपको बताना चाह रही हूँ कि सबसे पहला इंस्क्रिप्शन मथुरा का 2000 साल पहले पुराना है और वो इंस्क्रिप्शन खंडित है लेकिन जो लाइंस उसमें बची हुई हैं वो एक बंदा एक व्यक्ति कह रहा है कि मैं यहाँ पर एक इमारत बना रहा हूं। और मैं इमारत किसके लिए बना रहा हूं और ये उनके शब्द हैं मैं वासुदेव के लिए बना रहा हूं वासुदेव शब्द है और कहां बना रहा हूं वासुदेव के महास्थान पर क्योंकि बाकी इंस्क्रिप्शन खंडित है तो मैं कह नहीं सकती कि महास्थान का मतलब क्या है लेकिन महास्थान हम समझ सकते हैं कि एक ग्रेट प्लेस है ठीक है और उसके बाद वहां से बहुत मूर्तियां मिली हैं आई डोंट वांट टू गेट इनटू दैट आपने अयोध्या का प्रश्न पूछा पूछा तो सोलवी शताब्दी में ओरछा की राजकुमारी पैदल गई अयोध्या 16th सेंचुरी में आप इमेजिन कर सकते हैं कितने खतरे हुए और उन्होंने कहा कि मैं राम को लेने जा रही तो वहां पे उनको राम नहीं मिले तो उन्होंने कहा मैं सरयू नदी पर अपना प्राण त्याग दूंगी so Sadhu Nadi, she entered Sadhu Nadi because she said, I did not find Ram. And when she entered Sadhu Nadi, she said, she said, she said, she said, there is something here, this is my palm. So the people who were with her, they ex- went to the Sadhu Nadi and there was a pratima. And that pratima, today, ओरछा वापस लेके गई और उन्होंने एक मंदिर बनाया उस मंदिर में वो प्रतिमा आप आज भी उसका दर्शन कर सकते हैं अब ये कहना मुश्किल है क्योंकि क्या यही मूर्ति थी जब मंदिर को तोड़ा बाबर ने ये कहना मुश्किल है लेकिन हमको ये पता है अपने इतिहास के बारे में कि हमारी मूर्तियों को बचाने के लिए हमने उनको दफनाया मंदिर में फेंका कुएं में फेंका बहुत कुछ किया लेकिन सरयू नदी से एक प्रतिमा मिली है जो आज भी ओरछा में एक मंदिर में है जी ओके नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इट्स अ वेरी डिफिकल्ट क्वेश्चन और जिन्होंने ये सवाल पूछा है उनको आ, हमारी तरफ से आयोजकों की तरफ से पुरस्कार दिया जाएगा क्योंकि ए, इस प्रश्न का उत्तर हमारे यहां किसी के पास नहीं है और वो प्रश्न है डॉक्टर विनायक पांडे का पूछ रहे हैं गंगा जमनी तहजीब वो सेम डीएनए थ्योरी में तीन अंतर बताइए तो इसी पॉइंट पे अब हम इस कार्यक्रम को यहीं समाप्त करेंगे
आप सभी दर्शकों का बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद मीनाक्षी जी का बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद मीनाक्षी जी बहुत सारे प्रश्न और भी हैं आपको मैं अलग से दे दूंगा आप देख लीजिएगा उनको आभास जी का और विक्रम संपत जी का भी बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद जय हिंद वंदे मातरम